to the doctor's office, many times, um, you know, a uh, doctor will prescribe to you either, uh, you know, different types of medication. One of those is a pill, perhaps. Another one is a shot. And these different types of medication represent um, different types of uh, medicines that we have currently available. Uh, the most common one you know are drugs, which are chemicals. Um, others are kind of hormones that um, uh, help you balance your internal physiology. And uh, vaccines, which are often you know, uh, components of uh, inactive viruses, which help you gain immunity to specific diseases. And these medicines are all really great and very effective in many cases, but um, what happens what, and what do we do when they're not sufficient in treating a specific disease? What we are trying to do is actually develop a cells, a living cells, as kind of a, a therapy. And um, these are kind of typically called living drugs. Examples of these have um, <coughs> uh, include, for example, T cells, uh, which you see on top there, which is a, uh, the light blue cell, uh, light green cell, actually trying to kill the cancer cell right there. Uh, neurons and uh, beta cells, for example, for treating um, uh, diabetes as well. And these are drugs. Uh, these are not traditional drugs in the sense that they're chemicals, but they live and they su survive in your body for for a while and hopefully perform a function that can help uh, reduce the symptoms of a particular disease. So why do we need cell therapies? Well, um, I'd like to illustrate this with a, a, um, a, a uh, kind of a uh, illustration from uh, Richard Chow, who is uh, currently a distinguished career fellow at Stanford. He's a patient as well. So he lives with his wife and two daughters in the Bay Area. Uh, and every day he must kind of wake up um, and navigate himself to the bathroom where, he, where he's, there's 10 feet of, between him and the pill he must take, which is called levodopa for Parkinson's disease. And what he says about this is that the routine is the same every morning, um, edge to the side of the bed, then roll my legs off, use their weight to allow me to push my torso and head up with my arms, sit there for at least a minute, maybe more, try to stand. Um, I should not be slowing down like this. Um, I'm only in my 50s. I should still be competing in triathlons, as I did only a few years ago. I should be riding my bike to work each morning. Instead, I am forced to reimagine a future profoundly different than the one I had hoped for. And Parkinson's disease does this to you. <clears throat> And so the bathroom is really 10 feet away. Uh, my 10 milligram morning dose of levodopa awaits me with 10 other medications. Uh, levodopa is the magic pill that will fool me and others into thinking that nothing is wrong. And um, for patients like Richard Chow, uh, really pills are not enough for, for, uh, for him. And they would like a kind of more permanent cure so they don't have to go through this situation every day. Um, the other reasons why we look for cell therapies as potential medications is because they're often sometimes uh, the most effective types of medicine. Uh, for example, T cells now are, uh, are, are kind of medication that are, uh, you know, have been on the news in terms of exploring as a cancer treatment. Um, cell therapies have more, sometimes more lasting effects than chemical drugs. Uh, for example, um, one of our colleagues is pioneering the use of beta cells as kind of a treatment uh, long-term treatment for um, but diabetes, where normally diabetes, diabetic patients have to be prick their fingers every time and have insulin injected into their body. Um, cells can also be self-modulating when they actually get into the body, so they can actually um, stay for a long time and receive uh, signals from the environment and kind of respond to that environment by producing a certain signal. That is, for example, what we hope for in, in uh, Parkinson's disease. And, uh, the last thing is cell therapies are sometimes the, really the only way to replace cells that have been lost in the course of a uh, disease progression. Um, the field has traditionally had uh, a few obstacles to success. Um, the main one you've probably heard of before is immune system rejection. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, uh, typically if you have an organ transplant, uh, you want to, uh, you, we worry about having transplanting an organ which will be rejected by the immune system and won't function that way. Um, the reason is because the immune system in your body kind of rejects the foreign cells or organs that are put into it due to kind of specific signals that are present on the cell surface of a particular organ. 
Uh, and so when people do transplants, the, they must have a donor organ or cell that has a similar immune system. And so the, the really natural question that arises from this is whether or not we can make cells with a person's own DNA, if, or you can call them personalized cells, uh, to avoid the rejection problem. Uh, and so there was a discovery about, you know, in 2006 that allowed us to be able to get some hope about this problem, which is um, that, which are called induced pluripotent stem cells. These are stem cells that can be generated from a person's own uh, DNA. Uh, this discovery actually won the Nobel Prize in 2012. Uh, it allows you to convert uh, a person's differentiated cells using just the introduction of four genes back into a stem cell. And that stem cell, uh, which looks like the picture on the right, a cluster of the cells, uh, can then be re-differentiated back into any type of other cell in the body including you know, uh, heart cells, which are called cardiomyocytes, uh, fat cells, adipocytes, other types of neurons, all different types of cells in the body. And these cells are cells that retain the, cell, uh, the person's own DNA um, uh, in, the, in the cells themselves. That discovery was really based on uh, basic science studies that were done um, in called nuclear reprogramming uh, back in actually an animal in, called frogs. Um, uh, typically called Xenopus lavis, um, where people had tried to do experiments really um, taking differentiated cells, surgically removing the nucleus, and then transplanting them into an undifferentiated cell like an egg, and then being able to clone a whole animal like a frog out uh, again from those original uh, uh, transplants. Um, currently, the first type of uh, <coughs> attempts to use the stem cells uh, internationally in term to uh, treat a certain disease were reported in 2017 uh, for a specific disease called age-related macular degeneration. And in these cases, they were able to generate specific types of cells that can be called RPE cells that can be transplanted into the retina. Uh, and they were able to re uh, report some, some uh, positive results using, using that technique. The second major ob obstacle to success for stem cell therapies are a kind of current problem that we're working on, and that is how do we properly differentiate stem cells back into normal cells? Um, and uh, with, how do we do this with high purity and accuracy uh, to make cells that are very similar to what we see in, uh, in, in real animals? Um, and so one example of this is diabetes. And so diabetes is a disease where uh, there's an inability to control your blood sugar levels. Whenever you eat uh, food, that leads to an increase in the blood sugar levels of your, uh, uh, in your bloodstream. That then leads to a uh, release of insulin, which is another hormone from uh, what's called from your pancreas. Uh, these then lead to um, uh, adipose cells, fat cells taking up the sugar. Uh, Exercise can also decrease the blood sugar and in, in a cycle where actually uh, blood sugar is then controlled. But in diabetic patients, uh, beta cells are often non-functional and they uh, often lead to inability to control this entire process. Um, as a consequence, what happens is uh, many diabetics need to inject themselves with a commercial insulin uh, to be able to control their blood glucose levels. And um, many of you may know people who actually have to, have to do this. Um, and so being able to make beta cells that can properly sense the blood sugar level uh, in their environment and regulate their own insulin production are really potential long-term therapy. The other uh, disease that we're working on is really for, uh, um, Parkinson's disease, which has affected quite a few, num which is a very common disease that affects quite a number of Americans, including uh, uh, you know, actors like Michael J. Fox and Alan Alda. And these, this disease involves symptoms including movement disorders such as trembling and inability to walk. Um, and uh, the disease origin is really due to loss of a particular uh, neurotransmitter called dopamine, which is produced by certain type of neurons. Um, the current mainstay therapy, as the, I alluded to before, is to increase the production of dopamine with this drug called levodopa or L-dopa. Um, and... Uh, Historically, the first type of treatments that were done uh, 
attempted for Parkinson's disease was to try to use uh, fetal tissue grafts many years ago. Um, this showed some positive outcomes, but also kind of very severe side effects due to poor uh, purity of preparations. And so current efforts are kind of focused internationally on using embryonic stem cells or iPS cells to generate these type of neurons for transplantation purposes. Uh, so for what we're doing right now is kind of uh, more trying to figure out uh, how can we use our technology, which is called accelerated differentiation, in making uh, cell types that are safer, purer, and more uh, accurate and more faster. And with this technology, we really hope to overcome the obstacles associated with making cells into medicines and bring us into a future with personalized regenerative medicine. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you to CEE as well. Some people are just starting the clinical trials now for, for some of these cell types, and so we hope to be able to get to there within the next, uh, uh, not to the full, uh, starting the kind of the clinical trials for these within the next few years, yeah. I think now the, the technology of induced pluripotent stem cells really has reduced any of those concerns. Um, with using um, uh, uh, um, human cells because primarily those are derived from already differentiated cells, and so they don't carry any of the ethical concerns that are already present in using um, things from derived from embryos. Um, uh, uh, so right now, it's, uh, the ethical issue isn't really, the, the, I think, the main concern in our field now. It's more the technical issues of how do we make it happen.